we leverage our policy engagement. So when we work with countries and we talk about fiscal sustainability, a sound monetary policy, we integrate climate so it is part of that uh, soundness of policy reforms. And number three, because we can leverage finance with other institutions and most importantly with the private sector. Here is our reality. Unless we change the trajectory of carbon emissions in emerging markets and developing economies, now by 2030 they would contribute 66% of the emissions, 20% more than they did some uh, decade ago. So for all of us, and that goes to all hands on deck, for all of us it is so critical that we help emerging markets and developing countries to transform to low carbon and climate resilient trajectory or otherwise we are all cooked. <laughs> That's uh, that's both one way to say it and uh, also absolutely true. So we appreciate, appreciate your leadership, Kristalina. Both Rwanda and Barbados have received preliminary uh, approvals of, of programs under the RST. And perhaps uh, Prime Minister Motley, I could come to you next to describe how will this program in Barbados uh, work towards the vision that Kristalina just laid out of reducing emissions and protecting against vulnerability. And frankly, you have been such an extraordinary global voice for reshaping the financial architecture to deal with climate head on through the Bridgetown Initiative. How is this related to your vision of a more just global financial system? Well, thank you very much, Raj. And I want to start this morning by congratulating Kristalina and Uma and all of the staff at the IMF for being brave enough to think outside the box. Four years ago, I stood on this platform for the first time with Kristalina. You were at the World Bank then. Christine was here. And there were some powerful speeches made then. And this morning is testimony to what can happen when we think outside the box. And I really, really want to commend all of you for allowing us to be here and to change the assumptions that guided the functioning of this institution and hope that this will now trigger others to have the confidence to do the same. Um, for us, we are not in the business of just a single issue um, that can define us. And therefore, how we treat to development and climate resilience is part of the same conversation. And we've been saying for some time now that we need long-term capital in order to address many of the issues. If not, we will just be crowded out. This is not a new concept. Britain understood it needed long-term capital when it was financing World War I. Germany understood it needed long-term capital after its defeat in World War II. Small countries and middle-income vulnerable countries need it if we're not going to be pauperized. And these institutions were set up, yes, to fight poverty, not promote poverty. So that the ability now to be able to deal with the vulnerability is critical if we're going to have the growth the macroeconomic and financial stability that you spoke about, and the jobs above all else that make life worthwhile for, for average citizens. We suffer, for example, from not just the hurricanes, but we suffer from a groundwater crisis. And the ability to replace our water mains is in and of itself a 20 to 25 year exercise alone. So that you need to be able to have access to capital that will at least not cause you to have difficulty while maintaining your other obligations for development. 20-year capital starts it. We would like to see quotas removed because we feel that that's the one constraint, but we understand that this is a significant movement of the needle, and we will keep the pressure on for the quotas to be removed. But we also understand that that is a function of the response of the rest of the developed world being able to put more into the pot so that more people can benefit. So um, we look forward to this being able to help us with coastal defense, water mains, um, <clears throat> a number of other early warning systems, and above all else, the repurposing and re reconstruction of our housing stock. If we get hit tomorrow, my greatest fear is that we will lose about 70% of our low and lower middle income housing stock 
because of the manner in which roofs were constructed for the last 60 years. And that's part of parcel of why we call it a roofs to reefs project, because we have to change from our roofs right back down to the rebuilding of our coral reefs. And can I push you on one, <coughs> one uh, comment? As part of your Bridgetown vision, mm -hmm. you've also talked about extending the time horizon on debt sustainability. Oh, absolutely. Think about that. Can you say a, a, a quick, short comment about well, how important that well, is and why? And, and the IMF has done its part. We now need the other institutions to extend their timelines for development capital. Look, we cannot pursue education, health, all of the other SDGs and deal with climate all at the same time while managing all of the polycrisis issues that the world is facing unless we have some elbow room. We need elbow room fiscally. We need elbow room in terms of trade policy. We need elbow room in terms of other policy considerations. If we can get that, then we can put our countries on a sustainable path. And remember, if we don't carry along our people at the same time, you have social implosion. You can bring back down debt any time. Barbados has restructured its debt four years ago, three years ago, just before COVID came. If we didn't do that, God knows where we would be today. Secondly, um, having said we can restructure debt any time, I can't bring back a country after social implosion in under a generation. So that we need to understand that if ever there was a time for us to revisit debt sustainability metrics, it is now. And every dollar of debt is not equivalent. A dollar of debt to build a school does not give me the same rate of return as quickly as a dollar of debt to build a geothermal facility. So that we have to ask the economists, with all due respect, to dig a little deeper and to be a little more granular in terms of its metrics. And if we use these crude proxies, then we end up with crude results, which means people fall in between the cracks. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, let, let, me, uh, let, let me next turn to uh, President Kagame it's, uh, as we talk about a long-term time horizon on a focused development strategy. Rwanda stands apart in its region for having achieved some important successes on that trajectory. Uh, could you describe how and thank you for, for being here, because we know that the African Leaders Summit has uh, tremendous calls on your time. But could you describe how Rwanda will participate in this program, the Resilience and Sustainability Trust? And perhaps even more significantly, at COP27, you announced uh, the green, a, green, a Rwanda-based green climate f facility to bring together public and private finance. What's your vision for how this type of instrument, the RST, can actually accelerate public-private finance in Rwanda towards a stronger climate f future. Thank you. Let me thank also, uh, like uh, uh, my sister Mia has uh, uh, started with, thanking uh, Christina and the IMF for coming up with this innovative uh, way of doing things. Uh, so many things I have tried before and keep trying and there are things more to come. Uh, first of all, given the background of uh, COVID and, uh, that uh, devastated the economies, including the rich uh, countries, but of course you imagine how bad it is for the uh, weak economies like, like some of us in Africa or small island states and, and so on. So we are in search of what to do to recover, but also to continue anyway doing what was needed uh, even before uh, COVID. So with such a uh, initiative, RST helps, it finds uh, a different approach, adding to what exists already, as I said, thinking out of the box, and uh, enabling uh, countries to find resources uh, to do what they were doing before or to do better and more that they still had to do. And um, what we have to do is first even 
we have to prove a point here that with the resources, um, gaps can be filled, uh, economies can grow and people can thrive. Uh, but in many cases, as I said, with the COVID, when big countries are hit, they have so many ways of accessing finance. They, 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 uh, but for especially the African continent, developing economies, and we, we, we struggle to find ways to get out of uh, uh, this situation that we find ourselves in. So we, we will, it will help us, the, the RST will help us to deal with current shocks, the climate or health shocks that we have experienced, or even uh, create resilience, of course, for what is expected uh, and, and will come. Today we don't see clearly what is coming around the corner, but you, you always want to think like there is something coming that you have to deal with in any case. So that helps uh, create resilience uh, in, in uh, our economic policies uh, and actions uh, to, to, to be able to move forward. Uh, moving to the what we call the IREME, uh, the fund that we created, it's again trying, first of all, to take responsibility for ourselves. Uh, but at the same time, uh, having done that, we want, therefore, to tell our partners that if we can put this together ourselves, you surely should contribute more towards it uh, so that we, we, we are able to deal with the, uh, these future challenges or the current ones in terms of uh, climate or, or uh, health, the pandemics that we, that has already happened and, and that are likely to come in the future. At the same time, we call upon partnerships between the public and the private because uh, governments alone cannot really uh, do much on, on their own. Uh, and that's why we encourage the private sector to contribute towards that as well. Uh, and, and we are seeing now that uh, even the, our partners have contributed towards the REME. Our, our target uh, was uh, 350 million US dollars. Uh, so far we have raised uh, above 100 million. So that's a, a good uh, uh, step forward. Uh, and uh, so we want to do that. Uh, at the same time, now building on uh, RST, uh, I think. Uh, but we are just doing it as Rwanda, but we are thinking about it in the context of uh, how the African continent can also be uh, benefit from this. Uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, the small island states that are affected uh, broadly. But I think we need to get started and get going. If we can demonstrate that this works and, and works well, then uh, I think to even uh, invite more partners or maybe to step in and make their contributions. Well, that's an excellent note to conclude your comment on. Uh, <laughs> Obviously, Barbados, Rwanda, a handful of other countries will be first to demonstrate how this can, in fact, leverage public and private resources towards its objectives. And Kristalina, you suggested you have a target for thinking about private sector financial leverage, which ultimately public-private is the instrumentation here that will address the crisis at hand. Mokhtar, you lead an institution designed to achieve that leverage. Um, and you also, through the uh, CCDRs, which you could describe to us, have a collaboration with the IMF so that this, in fact, is an, is an example of good collaboration between the IMF and the World Bank. Could you describe that collaboration and then describe how, building on President Kagabe's remarks, countries can use RST resources to unlock even more private sector investment on top of that? Thank you, Varaja. Kristalina, it's a pleasure being here. President Kagame, Prime Minister Mia, my sister Ngozi, thank you very much for 
uh, inviting me to, the, to this uh, event. For me, it's, uh, it's very important to talk about it here. I spent a few years of my professional career in this place. And actually, it reminds me of what happened in the 90s when we had uh, those big shocks. And actually, uh, Kristalina, uh, your leadership has been very instrumental in uh, translating all the knowledge that the IMF had in addressing a global public good and massive shock. Actually, the shock that we are having linked to climate change have huge impact on balance of payment of each of the country. So it's at the core of your mandate. But I think also that I remember at the bank when I was here, at that time we were writing a letter of comfort for the World Bank when the World Bank was preparing budget support. The fund was having an Article 4. You write a letter of comfort to the bank, which realized at that time that it was important to address macroeconomic imbalances. The way today we see the, the reverse. Yes. I, uh, uh, the uh, IMF has really showed that climate change has a massive shock on the economies. Use the CCDR of the World Bank yes. as a letter of engagement for the World Bank to be able to disburse money. And I think that's an illustration of what is collaboration and adaptation over time. And I think I would like to commend you really very much, uh, Kristalina, for having done that and show the complementarity of the two institutions. Second point, President Kagame, when we talk about CCDR, people think that it's a, it's a, it's a diagnostic. Let me give just some number. Rwanda emission represent 0.0003% of world emissions. Let me repeat that number. 0.003% of world emission. The, the emission per capita is one twelfth of the world average, one fifth of the Africa average. In spite of it, the country decided to put huge amount of the scale resources to address climate change. For me, that is commitment. And if I see such a commitment, and there I is that's also an investment in a global public good yes. that should be paid for by all of us. I will come to that. Yeah. I say this is a commitment, <laughs> but I think it's important to remind it to the rest of the world because we talk about it in generic terms, but when people put their money where their mouth is, it has to be highlighted. Yes. Yes. And for me, that's what I wanted to do by saying that. So a country which emits 0.003% and put and collect $100 million to, needs to be commended. But that will not be enough, as you say, to address the global public good. We will need to leverage all this. And the big lesson that we have learned is that public money will not be enough. It will not be enough. Only $2 billion in two, a private money went to adaptation in 2019 and 20. Only $2 billion. This is very small to address floods, to address all the issues that the Prime Minister have, have mentioned. So we need to mobilize more resources. And I think that this uh, trust fund is extremely important for three reasons. It will create the policies to crowd in more money from the private sector by having the taxonomy, by working on the capital market, by working on the bond market, by creating the conditions in the financial sector to be able to crowd in more. Secondly, it will give some seed money to government to do more PPPs because those PPPs are the public part in the financing that need to be financed. So government will need the public part in the financing of the PPP. But we are convinced at IFC that we should not be a remake of the past. Part of the production of the economy generated by this adaptation should be located in developing countries. It should not be a situation where in the future, all the product will be produced in advanced countries and imported for consumption in developing countries. So the work that uh, Rwanda is currently doing, trying to put, to assemble uh, two wheelers, electric two, -wheeler, two wheelers, and, and so forth, to have hydrogen. That you are producing hydrogen now in, uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, Barbados is also part of the conversation. So I think that what you are calling here, and Kristalina, is the most global conversation. It's about financing the immediate need, contributing to public, public uh, 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 good, but also to change the paradigm of development of countries to make part of the, of the supply chain. And there is not a greater champion for that than my sister Ngozi here, who has been always pushing 
for us to create supply chains which are resilient to external shocks. And when African, through the African Free Trade Agreement, we have a solid supply chain, resilience, and transformation will happen on the continent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're, well, we're now going to come to Ngozi uh, to uh, share your vision of, of how trade and climate interact and how the RST can be deployed in a manner that helps countries advance really what their primary objective most often is, which is expansion of trade, development of resilient supply chains, ensuring access to both raw material and finished goods in both directions. And I would also note, as Director General of the WTO, you've had a tenure during a time when you've dealt with health crises and climate crises. So your vision of how the RST can accelerate even the WTO's role in bringing together deals and collaborations that address those crises would be extremely welcome. Ngozi. Well, thank you, Raj, and uh, what a pleasure to be with a wonderful group of people. You know, congratulations to the IMF, to Kristalina, and uh, I'm really excited to see Rwanda and uh, Barbados be at the forefront of demonstrating what this, uh, this can do and having Makta here to leverage further resources 10 to 1 <laughs> from every, the IFC. Every grant given <laughs> gives 10, 10, $10 in, in uh, climate change investment. Yeah, so it, it's an exciting time and people <coughs> may be wondering, so what is trade? What is, why is trade here? What does it have to do? And it's very important uh, that, that um, Kristalina, it's important you ask that I come and join this because people do not often think of the partnership or the role of trade in all of this. Um, and trade can be a great facilitator of making things happen, or it can also be an obstruction if trade policies are not well uh, handled. So let me come to that. I, I want to take off from, from where Makta uh, very nicely uh, landed. Uh, part of the interest in this is I do not believe that you can build resilience if you don't have good trade policies to support that. It's just a fact. You need the innovation to flow from where it is made, whether it's in developing or developed countries, to where it's needed. You need the goods and services to flow. And without trade, this simply cannot happen. Affordability of all of this, you also need to look at trade policy and see what's happening with tariffs. Do we have a regime that makes these goods and services and these innovations affordable and accessible? That is also the role of trade, to move things around at an affordable cost. Now, the very important thing that Makta said is as we looked at what happened, the lessons learned from the pandemic, from the war in Ukraine, we saw that if we are to build resilience in developing countries, in fact, globally, we have to look at what happens with supply chains. And we see that supply chains for certain products are highly concentrated. 80% of vaccines are exported from 10 countries. You look at where solar panels, chips, so many things that are important to building resilience are manufactured, they are concentrated. And I said to myself, for instance, why is it why should Africa import 99% of its vaccines and 95% of its pharmaceuticals? Why can't we deconcentrate and diversify manufacturing and base it in these countries so we have supply chains that are global and diversified and more resilient? And so, so that is where trade comes in. I'll illustrate that further by saying that, look, you can have all the money and the financing, and I respect all of that. It used to be my business, too, <laughs> and still is to some extent. But I found out in the pandemic what happened when the COVAX had all the money to import vaccines. What happened? It couldn't because there were export restrictions that were put in those countries that had the vaccines that stopped the export to those that needed it. And so they were at the back of the queue. Africa, in fact, did not get vaccines still. It was too late. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure that trade policies are well aligned. Well aligned 
to change the narrative that we can manufacture in developing countries. We don't have to be exporters of raw materials all the time. We can manufacture and export. We are also centers of innovation. Quite frankly, there's so much innovation happening in many of the developing countries that no one hears about because it's not spread. All that can be done through trade and trade policy. So that's the premise on which I say, do not forget, finance is great, but if you don't have the right measures in, in place trade-wise, it will stop you. So it's good. I also want people to remember that when the IMF and World Bank were created, the WTO GATT was created at the time, which morphed into the World Trade Organization. And there was a reason, because it was clear that you need all three working together to make things function. Yes. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, here, here. I think we all. Uh, that's, that's a very important reminder, Ngozi, of what it actually takes to use these and other resources to turn it into both growth and resilience in a climate context. We uh, have an opportunity to take questions from the audience. I think the first, there are three microphones set up, if you can see them, one in the middle and one on either side, so you're welcome to line up at the microphones. We also have an online system for getting questions, uh, and I think our first question has already been assigned to a DevEx uh, uh, reporter, Shobtai Gold. Shobtai, if you're here, we welcome uh, your first question. You're here in Washington right now. I assume you're having some conversations uh, for the visiting uh, president and prime minister. Are you speaking about more rechanneling of SDRs to the RST? Because as, you know, as much money is in there, the needs of the countries are obviously greater, particularly for long-term uh, climate finance. So what are you hearing, and are you expecting uh, more donations in the near future? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we could go to Kristalina and President Kagame on that. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I will start. Um, uh, the big innovation of the RST actually came with the recognition that when we provided 650 billion dollars SDR allocations to all our members, a significant part went to countries in strong position that actually didn't need it. So what did they do? They put it at the bottom of their reserves and it became a sleeping beauty. And then we thought, why not? A kiss that wakes it up. <laughs> and that is what we actually did. It's a very simple thing, saying at the, in a world where needs are so gigantic and resources are constrained, we should not allow a dormant asset if we can make something out of it. And that idea got a pickup by, by many leaders, and I'm extremely grateful uh, to them, and it led to a commitment of 20% of SDRs of countries in strong positions, strong reserves, to be directed through the IMF through two vehicles, the Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust and the newly created Resilience and Sustainability Trust. Where we are today, as Uma explained, we have pledges and avail, uh, uh, half of, with, uh, of which is already uh, in our hands for $40 billion. When we started, we had no idea what the demand is going to be. And now we are becoming a victims of our success because demand is very, very strong. And it is already an issue in our discussions our board members concerned about equitable treatment are already saying, well, maybe you shouldn't go with 150% of quota so we can, we can have funding for everybody. Well, the alternative, as your question implies, is we get more resources into the RST. Uh, and I want to recognize France for being the first uh, uh, advanced economy to say we are committing 30% of our uh, SDRs. And uh, also, 
uh, recognize uh, that uh, uh, countries, uh, uh, many countries are saying, OK, if this is successful, we might consider. Uh, China came up with a very strong uh, uh, commitment to the RST. So we would like to go back to our membership with successes. Here it is how it works. This is what it delivers. Uh, and I do believe that would be a strong advocacy. Now, since your question said, are you going to suggest that there should be more on lending uh, through, through uh, of SDRs? I think this is a question for President Kagame and uh, uh, Prime Minister Motley. I hope you would put a good word. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, do you, do you believe this will be part of the dialogue during this current African Leaders Summit? At least it should be. Yeah. Uh, and here the problem, uh, adding to what Christina has uh, said, and IMF uh, having led the charge on this, uh, even for SDRs and other institutions. Really, technically, there are very sound propositions as what we can do to deal with all these issues. Yes. So the, the, the main problem is, is, is not the technical side of it. It is political will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think this is what we've got to keep talking about and raising and even having cases that prove the point, if, as, as I said earlier. So starting with the literal we have in our hands already, we can show how that has helped the, well, billions of people here across the world, if you will. So the conversation has to go on. It, it will be part of this. Otherwise, why, what else should we be talking if we don't bring this among uh, the things that we have to talk about. So in short, really, it, it's the propositions that the proposals you have put on the table are very clear, technically sound. They can even be tweaked and find even improved and better ways. But political decisions have to be made to let this thing work, and that's what we shall keep talking about. Well, uh, let me thank you for that because I think it's absolutely essential that more people in public uh, life, but also in gen the general population, appreciate that the global fight on climate change is won or lost in developing and middle-income economies, which has not always been the way it's been approached um, politically. The, the, we have a number of questions from our online community of uh, participants. And the next one is for, uh, is for Prime Minister Motley. And, and also for President Kagame, but I'll come to you, Prime Minister. Since the board approval of your country's request to access the RST, can you share the initial reaction from your populations and the private sector? Has the catalytic role of the RST in generating private, uh, private finance uh, met your initial expectations? Well, to begin with, it's only since the 7th of December, so we've got to give it some time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but I have every confidence that it will. And certainly in the Bridgetown Initiative, it allows us to take one off and remove it from the initiative. Because one of the things that we called for is the RST, there, as I said, and I really want to thank you. But the reality is that we need to do more, and we need to do a lot more. And whether it is, it all comes back down to political will. I want to thank President Macron for coming out, not just with the RST, but also for agreeing that we're going to have a conversation, colloquium, whatever you want to call it, summit. in June or July, a summit that will allow us to deal with the whole issue of changing the basis on which financing goes to the Global South. Because it is not working, and it cannot work. And if we use the innovation that we see here with the RST, then we can be sweating far more capital out of the multilateral development banks. We should be making the multilateral development banks capable of accessing the SDRs. We should be looking at the creation of a climate mitigation trust that looks to the fact that mitigation doesn't have to take place in small countries or in vulnerable countries. Mitigation has to take place on Earth, on the planet Earth. And wherever it takes place, then it stops us from reaching two, two and a half degrees. 
against that backdrop, if we can use the special drawing rates to leverage private sector capital, to be able to also unlock the best projects for mitigation, to save the earth as a global community, that works for us. Adaptation, however, and loss and damage funds need to come to countries so that we can execute. And Ngozi's point and Maktar's point with respect to industrial strategy and trade is critical. Unless there's a just industrial strategy, this is just about coming up on a platform and making commitments and then don't have the capacity to meet the commitments. We cannot get, right now, electric cars. We cannot get panels, photovoltaic panels. And when we leave here, President Kigame, Maktar, and myself go to deal with pharmaceutical equity in Gozi because we are deciding to take our own future in our own hands to bring about manufacturing in Africa, in the Caribbean, and the Americas for pharmaceutical equity. We need to see the same now if we are to change commitments for net zero into reality. And unless there is a rethinking, one, of debt sustainability, two, trade strategy, three, how we preserve macroeconomic and financial stability and growth, we are not going to make it in this world. And the Bridgetown Initiative is fundamentally about saying, let's reset. And if we don't reset and create some global public commons, we are not going to preserve the way of life that we have. And this is just climate. We'll start talking about biodiversity yet. Well, let, let me just say, each, each of those each of those objectives you laid out, taking advantage of the opportunity to build resilient supply chains, addressing the net zero transition, uh, building a more inclusive economic growth are all opportunities that require investment. And the Bridgetown Initiative is a bold vision of how to actually generate the type of investment like the RST that can meet the needs at scale. And, and let me just say, the whole question of natural disaster clauses, and I want to thank the United Kingdom I believe they've announced that their export credit agency will start to use natural disaster clauses. Because let me tell you, if we get hit tomorrow, there is no one entity, company, country, institution that's going to give Barbados the 18% of GDP that is unlocked in our natural disaster clauses for the first two years of reconstruction. Yes. Excellent. We, we are a bit yep. short on time. What we're going to do is we have some questions here in the room. So let's, uh, if you could introduce yourself, ask a brief question. I'll ask our panelists to be very concise with their response. And then I'd like to do one quick lightning round uh, for, for this group to get to share some observations about the near future. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Aldo Cagliari with Jubilee USA Network. Uh, OK, I will stay with one question, and it's uh, to uh, 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 Ms. Georgieva. Uh, so, um, we hope that uh, this, uh, you know, the commitment that the G20 made to 100 billion, that we can turn it eventually into 200, 400 billion of rich energy, and I think that's possible. Uh, and we need to build this body of experience. And one thing, one action that the IMF, I think, can easily do to help us uh, on that, to help us on that advocacy, because this is an advocacy we have to do country by country with the donors. Huh? Uh, if the IMF could have a web, web page where it lists the contributions of the countries, uh, and then it says, you know, what, I mean, what are the, 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 the agreements and, um, and, and where are they going? Like, uh, this is PRGT, X amount, uh, RST, X amount. That would help immensely, and I think it's a relatively low cost uh, action for the IMF. Uh, th thank you. That's an easy one. <laughs> yes, we will do. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And the idea that such transparency can help build political will yes. is consistent with what President Kangami noted. Yeah. Uh, since and that was thank brief... You, thank you for the advocacy uh, <laughs> so, so, for the world, not for the fund. Uh, since for that was world. brief, before yeah. we go to our lightning round, I will ask one more question that came in mm. uh, from online. And this is a question, Ngozi, for you which is what more could be done by the WTO to facilitate access to technology for emerging markets and developing countries to facilitate the transition to net zero? Well, thank you. Uh, that's a really good question because one of the things I'm trying to say is that trade is part of the resilience. Trade is part of fighting climate change and finding uh, solutions. So what more can be done? I think that one of the things we can do is if we can have an environmental goods and services agreement, uh, which seeks mm. to bind countries to uh, respect a certain list of goods. It can be a constrained list to begin with. 
that countries need for building resilience, you know, for, for trying to decarbonize and get on the path to net zero. This will be a good thing. Uh, it will make it accessible and affordable to countries to, to be able to get these goods. Um, there was an environmental goods agreement that was being negotiated. It was shelved in 2016 with about 200 goods where the tariffs would be either very lowered or, you know, completely done away with. Uh, we need to, it was shelved because there were disagreements on certain goods. We need to revive this. I think this is a net contribution that really the WTO can make. The other area is looking also at innovation. And what can we do when we have innovation made somewhere that is beneficial to the planet, to the world? How can we share it? We are the guardians of intellectual property agreements. And I want to make it very clear here that we respect innovation. It needs to be incentivized. So that's not the issue. The issue is how do we do that, but at, at, at the same time make it accessible uh, you know, to those that need it so that they can manufacture they can produce their own things in place. They are not always sitting back as recipients. And what we've been doing is having dialogues with CEOs of the various uh, um, supply chain shipping companies, with manufacturers of pharmaceuticals, manufacturers of different kinds of goods, in, in, in order to start this dialogue with the private sector. How do we do this? Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yes. Uh, to wrap us up, I'm going to ask each of our extraordinary panelists to share one quick thought that listeners and online participants should keep in mind as we go into 2023, perhaps a critical year for actually making progress on these issues in a way that changes the trajectory of the climate fight and, frankly, the fight for climate justice. And perhaps I could start with uh, Prime Minister Motley. Thank you just to ask the world's populations to get on board because the fueling of political will comes when ordinary people stand up and say it must happen. And unless we reset in the way that you started through leadership, collaboration and innovation, we're not going to be able to sustain our quality of life in the next 10 to 20 to 30 years. Excellent. Makhtar. This transformation will be done differently from the rest, so the previous one. We need to have private sector innovation. We need to leverage. And the private sector needs to take more risk to address this global public good. And uh, with that, I think that we can achieve the goals that we have set. Excellent. And Gozi? There's so much geopolitical tension now. There's talk of decoupling and fragmentation. And I just want to say that for 2023, if we decouple or fragment, into trading blocks. We will not, and I repeat, not be able to solve any of these com problems of the global commons, which require cooperation. So my strong message for 2023, if we want to deal with climate change in a collaborative fashion, if we want to deal with perhaps preparing for the next pandemic and so on, let us dial down the talk on decoupling of fragmentation. It will be very costly to the global economy it will not help us solve the problems we need. Yes. President Kagame. Well, there is a lot to do individually, whether countries or institutions. There is even more to do together, but in a manner of proving the concept of what we are doing and get the results and show that things can work. And if we do that, then we get more encouraged to do even more. Excellent. Yep. Crystalina, the RST is yours to show things can work. Yes. What is your closing thought for well, us? Well, uh, uh, first, I want to introduce somebody in the audience, uh, Deputy Managing Director Bo Lee. He is the one responsible to oversee our climate uh, uh, work. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm thrilled there are so many of the staff of the IMF in the, in the audience. This is commitment. <laughs> to my to my to my troops, uh, my my message is the following: 2023 is going to be a difficult year for the world, and the silver lining can only be that we use it to transform our economies, that we accelerate change, that will underpin sounder prospects for growth, and that. We, the IMF, 
fully recognize our responsibility to be a force for good. And a force we will be, all of us.